Hey everyone, so this Unit 8 video is about James Marcia's theory on um, some, um, some specific types of identity crises that you're likely to see teens and young adults go through. Uh, essentially, even though this is not technically what he did, he kind of took uh, Eric Erickson Stage 5. Please check out Eric Erickson in another Unit 8 uh, video. He basically took um, Erickson Stage 5 of Identity versus Role Confusion and more or less kind of expanded on it. Again, that's not necessarily what he did, but that's kind of how you can look at this, per se, is that he took a, a little bit deeper look into the types of ways that teens can become anxious, stressed, or assured and confident of what they want to do with their life based on the definitions of how they perceive uh, what they've chosen through um, selling and um, basically dealing with their identity crisis. So, first of all, um, all teens go through identity crisis. We talk about this in the Eric Erickson video, that all teens have to go through identity versus role confusion, and that a large part of being a teenager is, you know, learning out, you know, learning, you know, why am I here? What do I want to do with my life? What's my purpose? What's my goal? You know, you know, what do I want to be known for? How do I want to fit in? What do I want to stand for? And so Marcia also believes that, you know, teens have to go through an identity crisis, um, technically, the definition he argues uh, as an identity crisis is, is an extreme period of severe inner turmoil, severe inner conflict, severe uh, internal anxiety that teens go through, typically because they become very worried, very anxious, very preoccupied with thinking about their future and also like how they want their life to be let out. And there's definitely reasons why we would think an identity crisis is pretty much universal. First of all, you know, um, the future is very unknown. Uh, there's a million ways you can live your life. There's all types of choices, all types of avenues, all types of pathways. You're also getting all types of pressure from parents and other adults and society that basically says, you know, you got to do something with your life. You got to figure out what you're going to do with your life. You got to, you know, settle on this. You got to figure this. You got to have a plan. And the fact that there's a million different ways your life could live out. And of course, that other lingering idea. You only get one shot at this. You only get to live your life once. So you got to make sure you definitely, you know, prioritize what do you want. So essentially what that does is that leads to four types of identity crisis, he says. I do want to point out that ideally you're going to want to reach what he calls identity achievement. However, along the way, there definitely could be a series of these uh, that may happen. Now, Specifically, what he targeted was your career, like your occupation and your career, what you plan on doing for a living. However, you could also easily take this theory and apply it differently on how you feel about what school you plan on going to attend, um, you know, what you care about in a partner, your religious beliefs, your political beliefs, how you want to raise children, uh, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of things you could use for this that are pressing examples, and I'll try to use a little bit of everything, but again, it mostly does come back to your identity in terms of what you want to do with your life, an actual career, a future, a financial uh, decision in terms of as a worker and things of that, as an occupation. So there's four identity crises, identity achievement, identity foreclosure, identity moratorium, and identity diffusion. Now, I do want to point out real quickly before I move to an image that shows all four of these and how they work, um, I do want to point out that the goal is identity achievement. However, identity moratorium is also good. It is not the end game. Uh, but it is definitely a good sign. And then identity foreclosure is not considered good, and identity confusion, uh, sorry, diffusion is not considered good. Um, but for example, while identity achievement is the most, um, you know, best scenario, and it may take a while for you to reach that, you may go through one or more of these other types of crises on your road to hopefully a reaching identity achievement. But for example, for me, when I was when I went off to college, I definitely was experiencing identity moratorium. I did not know I want to what I wanted to major in. Uh, I was actually a pre law major with an emphasis on economics. I was interested in that, but I was also interested in lots of other things. And so I definitely went to college with moratorium, and that's okay uh, because I was keeping my options open and I was thinking about it. And I was exploring, and ultimately I ended up settling on um, on education, and and I love it. I absolutely love being a teacher. Any of you guys who have had me long enough, you know, you know, I love being a teacher. I love that. 
um, and that took a while for me to reach identity achievement. So let me show you the chart that I'm going to work off of here. So here is an actual chart. Uh, that this is actually the simplest chart I could find to try to make it as simple as possible. But you'll notice that there are basically two variables here. How, how much are you exploring? Are you exploring a lot or are you exploring a little when it comes to your options? And commitment. How strongly committed? Are you highly committed to the choice you're making or are you not highly committed to the choice that you're making? So ultimately, there's high, expect high exploration and low exploration, high commitment and low commitment, and that produces the four different scenarios. So we'll start with the most ideal outcome first. The most ideal outcome is identity achievement. Identity achievement is high exploration and high commitment. You've weighed lots of options. You've looked at all kinds of alternatives. You looked at all kinds of ideas and you have committed that, yep, this is what I want. After looking at everything, this is what I want to do. So for example, with identity achievement, you know, you've thought about it a lot. You've gone through, you've, you've sampled a lot. You've tested a lot. You've done a lot of thought. You've had a lot of possibilities like, nope, this is where I want to go to school. This is what I want to major in. This is what I want to do for a career. That is identity achievement. If you are you know, completely committed to your religious beliefs or your political beliefs or, you know, do you want to have children? How will you raise them? That would be identity achievement because you've, you know, you've, you've thought about lots of different things. You've questioned things. You've done a lot of research. You've done a lot of exploration. And you're like, nope, this is what I believe and this is why I want this and that's what I'm sticking with and you're firmly committed. So you have high exploration and options and you have high commitment because you have settled on the one that you want and you know it's what you want now the other one that is considered good is identity moratorium and identity moratorium is you are doing lots of exploration on options but you haven't actually made a firm commitment yet so maybe you know you're religious but you're still kind of working through your religious beliefs and what actual religion or religious practices do you think maybe your political beliefs you're all over the place in terms of like well i have lots of ideas i'm not sure where i stand yet obviously for a lot of you you may be having identity moratorium with relationships you know, you, you've dated a lot, you've talked to people a lot, you've flirted a lot, you've done lots of things, but you haven't, you're not in a committed relationship yet, you haven't settled down yet, you haven't decided that this is the person you want yet, but you're definitely, you know, you know, thinking of it, you're playing your options, you're playing the field, you're flirting, you're reaching out. Again, identity moratorium could be you go to, maybe you've heard back from five or six, seven, eight colleges, you've been accepted to all of them, now you're weighing your options, but you haven't committed to one yet. That's moratorium. Um, same thing, like maybe you have committed to a school, but not a major, and you change your major a lot, but you're like, well, I'm not sure I'm doing, but you're thinking about it, you're researching it. That means you're high on exploration, but you're currently low commitment, but you're getting there. So that's called moratorium. So that's good as well. Um, identity foreclosure is bad for the most part. Uh, identity foreclosure, you haven't really done hardly any exploration at all but you have made a commitment. So you're high on the commitment, but you're low on exploration. So this could be something like, uh, I'm just gonna go do this because that's what my dad does. Or I'm gonna go to the school because that's the school my parents said are the best for me. Or imagine something like an arranged marriage. Now those can work out, absolutely, but you, you weren't even allowed to do exploration, but you were forced into high commitment. Uh, maybe taking over a family business. Maybe your parents are like, you know, if you don't follow these religious beliefs, we will disown you. If you don't go to this university or go into this career, we will not pay for it. So you haven't now, you've been forced into low exploration, but you've been forced into high commitment. Now, again, you may do this yourself. You may yourself also go into low exploration where you don't really weigh your options a whole lot. You just go straight into a particular career. You go straight into religious beliefs, political beliefs, because you don't you don't really need to think about it you're like no I don't, I don't need to weigh my options I've made my decision and you're committed to that so it's a low on exploration but it's high on commitment then identity diffusion is the one that definitely can be the most alarming to probably outsiders where you're not exploring options and you're also not really thinking much or you're not committing much to options either. So this could be something like, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't really care. 
Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't know what I'm going to do for money. I don't know what I'm going to do after high school. And honestly, I don't care. I'm like, I'm not thinking about it right now. Like, whatever happens, happens. Uh, obviously, some things in life you should totally YOLO. Uh, probably things like how to pay for your, you know, how to pay the bills, how to live independently, what you're going to do for a living. Those are not things you definitely want identity uh, diffusion for. So identity diffusion, you're like, eh, I'm not really sure you know, what I believe or where I stand or what I want to do. And I'm honestly not really thinking much about it. It's just, it's not really a high priority. So you're low on exploration and you're low on commitment. As you can see, hopefully you can understand why identity achievement is ideal. Identity moratorium is good. Identity foreclosure, you've made a decision, but the factors are not good. And then identity diffusion definitely is not good either. Um, so, and, and again, I'd point out that you may be in different places in your life on different things. Like you may be identity achievement right now for career, but you might be identity moratorium for political beliefs, or you might be identity moratorium with relationship stuff, but you're absolutely identity achievement for which university you're going to attend. So there's a lot of ways you, but again, his, his theory was specifically targeting career. Like, what are you going to do for a living? What are you going to do as an occupation? Um, the other thing, while I'm here, I just want to point out one other major factor, and that's about peer pressure. So as you get older, you know, when exactly, so what exactly is the definition of peer pressure? It is, you know, rather self-explanatory, but peer pressure is the amount of, uh, frankly, anxiety and stress that children and, and, and teenagers and adults feel when, you know, they try to balance the feelings of trying to conform to the wishes of others, to follow trends, to follow fads, to follow uh, the status quo. So it's about the intensity that you may feel and how much intensity is basically pushing you to maybe be more like your peers and be more conforming or to be more individualized. So there's definitely a conflict here. Because obviously all of us want to belong, but all of us want to be unique. And that is certainly one of the dilemmas of peer pressure, where you have this in, um, and you, you have this need to want to fit in, to want to belong, to want to be liked, uh, but you also want to be independent and express yourself and be individual. And so the peer pressure can definitely be a, a, a dilemma. Now, when exactly does peer pressure really begin? Frankly, as soon as kids get into school, peer pressure begins, even in kindergarten, even in first grade. Uh, my son, many times in kindergarten and first grade, um, has already asked for things such as like, well, I want this because, you know, my friends have this or my friends are interested in this or they, you know, have these. Can you buy this for me or that or that? That's that's already peer pressure. Now, again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with peer pressure because not all peer pressure is negative. That's a misconception. Much, you know, A lot of peer pressure may get you to do good things, um, but peer pressure uh, starts to appear even as early as kindergarten and first grade once kids starting to get into socialized environments. However, peer pressure basically in elementary school keeps going up and up and up and up. And you do need to know that basically peer pressure gets at its maximum intensity, its maximum pressure in about eighth to ninth grade. Think about like middle school, eighth grade. The, you know, the, the desperate need to fit in, the desperate need to be liked, the desperate need to be like everyone else, the desperate need to conform, the desperate need to have this or to have that, the desperate need to have acceptance. It becomes insanely um, high, basically from about 7th to 8th to ninth grade, and then after that, it does start to gradually decline. Now, don't get me wrong, peer pressure never goes away. But it definitely reaches its hilt. It reaches its peak at about 8th to ninth grade, and then it slowly starts to decline. So why? Well, why does it start to go down? Well, one of the reasons is that, and you know, as you know, I teach juniors and seniors. Um, juniors and seniors, yes, they are certainly prone to peer pressure. And some of you may know juniors and seniors that still are way too uh, responsive to peer pressure. But juniors and seniors, by the time, and then once you especially get beyond high school, um, a lot of that peer pressure starts to go down. It starts to wane. And there is a reason they think that may happen. And the reason may be is because of identity versus role confusion. Again, go back to the Eric Erickson video. Um, identity versus role confusion. In younger teens, role confusion is high, identity is low. As you get older and you start becoming more assured about what you think about, what you care about, what's important to you, then um, obviously your uh, identity starts to improve and your role confusion declines. Well, if you're experiencing role confusion, peer pressure is more intense. 
if you know less of who you are, you know less of what you're about, you feel less about what you stand for, you're more prone to the outside forces and susceptibility of peer pressure. However, as you start to develop a stronger identity about who you are, what you believe, what you stand for, then peer pressure starts to go down. So most juniors and seniors in high school and beyond, peer pressure starts to lose a lot of its power and a lot of its hold because the firmer you know who you are, the less you're concerned about what external factors may think of you. Peer pressure loses a lot of its weight, a lot of its power, if you're more assured of, I'd just rather be myself. Like, I know who I am, I know what I stand for, I know what I believe, you know, the, my real friends will like that, my real friends will accept me, and the rest of you, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I couldn't care less anymore. So as you get older, as you start to care less and less about what people think of you, and you care more and more about being true to yourself, then peer pressure's grip starts to slowly unravel. Uh, the rest of this right here, I don't really necessarily want to go into. You can read all about this, about why teenagers take a front seat in a teenager's life and why their parents take a back seat. Most of your friends certainly know you much, much better than your parents. Even if you have a good relationship with your parents, um, I imagine there's definitely a lot about you that they do not know, um, that your friends may know. And there's reasons why, and there's a whole bunch of information, most of which is pretty self-explanatory, but feel free to check it out. But again, so that is the... Um, that is the theory of Lawrence Kohlberg and how he views the identity crisis that teenagers must go through. As always, if you have any questions or concerns uh, about any of the material in this video, please let me know. Uh, send me a message. Otherwise, hopefully you found this to be useful and informative, and that's it.